guys, real quick, before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to inform you about this big giveaway we have going on right now. The ultimate RK elk hunt giveaway from now until September 5th. Every dollar you spend on our mobile app or our website gets you one automatic entry to win a $25,000 package to come hunt elk with us in the northern mountains of Utah this October. So don't hesitate. It's a short giveaway window, about three weeks. So get in there now for the opportunity of a lifetime. All righty, guys. Welcome back to another Hush Life podcast here at South Slopes. It is your host, Matt, and I am joined by a new guest. This is my uncle-in-law. Yep. Justin Gordon, and he is a mule deer slayer, and I've been so excited. I've been trying to get this podcast together for a couple years now, and it just hasn't worked out until today, and it couldn't have been any better timing with mule deer season literally weeks away, and I think anybody who has any desire to kill any type of large animal, whether it's deer, elk, sheep, mountain goat, Caribou, anything, will take something away from this podcast because Justin, I've had the privilege to hunt with him, to scout with him, and he has been a huge part in mentoring me into a semi half decent hunter. <laughs> and uh, he just has so many little nuggets of information that are often missed or not talked about. So, Justin, how. How did you get started in hunting? Period. Because, like, I know, I know your story. I know your family. But how did you get started in hunting? I have to think about that. I think it's just where you grow up, who you're around. Yeah. I don't know why it was something that was always of interest. My, but my father wasn't a big game hunter, so I don't know how. Mule deer, elk, backcountry, ever, because I didn't go on an elk hunt until I was old enough to go hang out with my brother-in-law, and we didn't ever see an elk, <laughs> right? And and I and I think my dad took me on one deer hunt because I begged him to, yeah. And one of his friends shot this little, like you could. I didn't know it had antlers until you know <laughs> we pulled up on it. Um, <clears throat> don't know. It's just one of those things that had always been there. I went on an archery hunt with my best friend in high school when we were seniors in high school, meaning I bought a tag, grabbed his brother's bow and some <laughs> aluminum game getters with the satellite broadheads and drove around probably right above where you live right now. In fact, I know right where we were. Yeah. Just drove around all day in the truck, a couple of four points off in the trees, get out of the truck, go walk after them, spook them a hundred yards out. I mean, just that sort of thing. It's it's um, it's just always been there. But more than anything, after I was, you know, through school, kids were coming along. That's when things, that's when I really started to, to just want to get away from everything, um, get away from work, but mostly get away from people. Mm -hmm. And the backcountry appealed to me. So that appeal of getting away from people is just... Just in your opinion, just to be able to hunt methodically and to have no other interruption, is that kind of the driver of getting away from people? Or do you believe there's larger bucks away from people? Or is it a combination of both? I think it started with the idea, the hope that big animals are going to go where people aren't. Yeah. But I think it was shortly after that I realized that's not the case, right? Big deer are just where they can find, carve out a little niche. Yeah. And and uh, and then, like everything, I think we just evolve. We kind of develop these ideas, but then, or a thesis, and then we go out and explore. And <clears throat> I remember my first night out by myself, um, sleeping on a bunch of, I thought it was cool because I cut down a bunch of pine tree boughs and threw them on the ground and threw my sleeping bag on top of that. It was soft-ish. <laughs> Um, made it one night on a planned five night, you know, solo trip and then threw everything in my backpack and hiked out these things, you know, everything that we're talking about, I just, if I could sum it up, it's just this continuing evolution of adventure, seeking adventure in a way that appeals to me, 
rock climbing or going to Mount Everest doesn't appeal to me. But being in the backcountry away from everything other than the animals and looking for what I think is going to be the biggest animal that that unit can produce at that particular point in time, um, that's going to put me in situations and conditions that I find adventurous and fun, right? So it starts wanting to get away from people, thinking that there are big animals where people aren't. And then eventually you just start to discover what you really enjoy. Yeah. And what's funny is what I enjoy today is probably, I, I know I didn't enjoy it the first couple of times I did it, and I don't know why I kept pursuing it. Right? It's not like being alone in the wilderness for seven days was the thing that I enjoyed the first time I tried it. But now I crave it. So how do you describe that evolution, or how does that come about? It's almost like a mental maturing, I would say, or like a, I've heard you tell me that like your dream is to retire and just go ridge running with llamas and just... <laughs> just just live up there. And that's And that's an evolution as well, because the llamas are becoming less and less a scene. We'll have to talk about that. Meaning my experience this past year coming out of the backcountry. But yeah, now it's gotten to the point where I could I can see being off grid for 14, 15 days all by myself. Yeah. If if I don't have other responsibilities, you know, my youngest is 13. Could I talk my wife into going to the backcountry with me for f- No. She might make it three or four, and then she'd have to meet me at the next trailhead sometime. But yeah, there, there's, there's a. Um, at some point in my life, I'd love to be able to just spend an entire summer in the backcountry with binoculars and spotting scope, not looking for anything in particular, but knowing when I've found it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So, Justin, for those listening and have no idea who he is, um, might be most well known for is this buck called the Gordon buck. And this buck kind of, uh, it just shook the whole hunting space. Largest mule deer ever killed with a bow, 348 inches. How many scoreable points? I forget now that was four years ago, five guys, but yeah, five years ago now the season, isn't that crazy? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, this buck guys, I've been able to see it in person and, um, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see some overlays of some images I have up here. But Justin has killed several deer, Boone and Crockett, with his bow. And it just, it's always interested me on people that can kind of go under the radar like this and just kill giant deer after giant deer after giant deer. And I honestly believe if this deer wasn't this substantial you, you would never know about Justin or never hear about him because he's specifically done it that way. He's, he's tried to fly under the radar. And I kind of, I don't want to make this whole podcast about, uh, about this deer or the story of this deer, but I definitely want to touch on it for a second. So Justin hunts a lot of you know, your Nevada, your Utah, your Colorado, your Idaho high country. And he was hunting a spot. Well, I'm going to have him tell you the story, but I'm going to give you a little summary. He's hunting this area, finds this deer, hunts this deer. We're going to get into the hunt a little bit. Ends up killing this deer and doesn't really even want to talk about it, but he feels obligated to based on how special this deer is. His friends are urging him. He has Boone and Crockett scores urging him that this is really going to shake the space. And I think this deer was a driving factor for Pope and Young to open a velvet category, wasn't it? I uh, I would... I don't know. They, I know that they had had a lot of deer over the years that had always kind of brought that idea up. We need a velvet category. I mean, people are hunting during a legal hunting season and we're not recognizing it because it is a week or two weeks or two days away from shedding its velvet. Yeah. And so the, I think, again, the story's kind of dated now, but, but I do believe that it had some influence. When, you, when they scored this deer, yeah, no one would know about this deer if it would have scored what I thought it scored. Yeah. 
when it was on the hoof, I was like, oh, it has enough extras. It's got to be at least 240, right? Yeah. Never imagined that I'd be 100 inches off in that instant, uh, in that estimate. But um, the reason being, and I think the reason that it's unique is the, the way the Pope and Young folks described it to me, is it's like a mid-180s mainframe, right? The frame on it, because of how unique it is, um, mid-180s with 150 inches of extras, which gross puts it at, you know, I think the highest scoring mule deer killed in a long time, 80, 90 years, you know. Um, but from an eye appeal standpoint, because it doesn't have your standard mule deer 4.200 inch mainframe, you have to really study that deer to figure out what's going on and, and how special it is. But I think that because it, it scores unique and it's got massive bases and not, not the cauliflower bases, the, you know, the stag bases, but genuine bases and you can see the veins running through it and everything. It um, captured some attention. Yeah, it's definitely, I definitely remember the argument, oh, it's a stag buck or it's not. But based on all the stag deer I've ever seen pictures of or seen in person, they kind of have that candlestick base where it's just like, mm -hmm. just nonsense at the bases. But this buck comes straight out of the head, has eye guards, splits off to his G2s and his main beam and everything kind of falls apart once it gets to his main beams and top of his G2s, you know, it looks like it would just be like a handlebar double dropper type of buck till it gets to its main beams, you know, and even up his G2s look normal, but his main beams kind of just melt down and it's an anomaly. This is, this is a deer that I don't think anybody could ever really pinpoint yeah. this deer, like stag, not a stag. And I know Justin and I have had this talk, like it had both testicles. It definitely uh, had, was a male, both testicles, no apparent injuries. Like, and I mean, Justin's watched a lot of deer in his day and like nothing about this buck stood out like anything crazy, correct? No, no, that was, uh, we were all wondering the whole time. And, you know, it nets out. I think it was 324, 328. I don't remember the net score. That's what it shows up in the Pope and Young book as. Something like that. But that's, I mean, <clears throat> so when you're fishing on a stream, I'm, I'm always looking at the next hole, right? Mm -hmm. When you're on the mountain, you kind of have to go see what's over the next ridge. You have to glass that in perfect morning light to find out what's there. And it's that type of a unique animal that I think drives a lot of us to just keep hiking, right? Yeah. To and keep looking over the next ridge because you don't ever anticipate anything like that, but you know that every once in a while things show up um, and it just fuels the fire. Yeah, this is definitely one of those stories that like people are like, oh, it's a farm buck, it's a ranch buck. I'm like, this thing is so far from any city, town, alfalfa field. Yeah. That, that's what makes it fun is, I mean, usually you're going to see something like that in an alfalfa field. For for that buck to exist where I like to hunt, um, that's just a bonus. Yeah. Right? I, I happen to want to be there and come across an animal like that. You can't, uh, you can't script those things. No. So, quick little, let's kind of talk about this hunt. Right? Mm -hmm. So you find the deer the first few days. And then this is kind of where I want to break down some of your method to your madness or some of your strategy. You spot this buck the first few days. Start from there, like from the time you saw this buck for the first time. Well, I think, first of all, it was a friend of mine that glassed it up f the first time, which, which is interesting because I had been into this area scouting in the summer. Hadn't seen this deer. Uh, we had kind of changed up game plans because it was a dry year and we weren't seeing animals where we wanted to see them. And so we had kind of moved around. But we all knew this this basic drainage and had spent time in it and had never seen anything like this. And then, um, gosh, I got to think it was the fifth day of the hunt before this animal was seen for the first time. And it wasn't by me, right? Um, and then... From that point on, I don't know that my tactics or ideas are going to be a whole lot different than anyone else's. 
But again, we're here we are several weeks, just a few weeks out from the opening of, of the Utah archery season. Um, Colorado archery is a little over a month out. And uh, Nevada is going to start in a couple weeks. And um, it's this time of year when I'm kind of at my all-time low because I'm like, I'm so excited for the hunt to start. But who knows what's going to happen with antler growth over the course of the next few weeks. And I just feel like I'm just another guy out there. I mean, I am. Mm -hmm. There's a million of me out there. Well, archery is not that big of a deal. But there's a few of us out there running around all looking for something special and hoping that we come across it. And, you know, once this animal was spotted, I think I just went into the same thing. One, you're already 10, 12 miles into the backcountry. You're, you're where you want to be, and you happen to come across an animal like that. And uh, from that point on, what was unique about the deer, and not so much I think my tactics, was just even for an early season hunt, this deer just did not stay out. Um, and I always felt like with the daylight hours, what they are opening of archery season, you're going to have an opportunity to see most animals mm -hmm. at, at first light. And this year, I'm convinced the reason we didn't see him until the fifth day of the hunt is just because he had, regardless of the longer daylight hours, he had been nocturnal because it was shortly after you started to get past that gray light time of day that he has already moved off into his bedding area and was gone for the day and into an area that you're just not going to see. And so it was just the same, I, I, you know, whether you, you talk to people that really have killed a ton of animals like Randy Ulmer and, or anyone else, you just know that, especially with mule deer, it's a waiting game. You can't just drop in on them the first time you see them because you're never going to see them again if you blow them out. And so it was the daily routine that anyone that wants an animal like this is going to go through. You're going to be on the ridge before the sun comes up. And you're going to be waiting for the opportunity when the wind and everything else is right so that you can make your move and get within archery range. And it just so happened, I think it was about another five days after we originally saw the deer, that it the, the weather shifted. We had a front come through, completely shifted the way the wind was blowing in that drainage. And he stayed out just a little bit longer and, and gave me a chance to cover the distance between the ridge and him. But I think that that's... You know, you hear about people doing some pretty extreme things to get an archery shot. And that's what's fun about archery is finding the animal is probably the easiest part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm not saying finding animals is easy. What I'm saying is it's the most simple part of archery hunting. Um, put another <clears throat> put another weapon in your hands. And uh, it's the finding is the most difficult part. Yeah. But with archery, everything's just beginning. You got five days of hoping you're, in this case, five plus days of hoping that you're going to be able to see that animal the next morning, hoping that things work out, that you can get within range, hoping that once you're there, you don't blow things up because you know if you do that you're not going to see him again. Um, that's, I don't think my, again, but I don't think anyone who's in that situation is probably going to do whatever it takes. And whatever it takes is just, like I said, you're, you're out of your tent before the sun comes up. And you're back in your tent when the sun goes down, and hopefully sometime in those daylight hours, Mother Nature works out in your favor. So, this the story is pretty cool. Like, this buck had this exact route every okay. morning. He was, it was like a highway. I admit, imagine it in my brain that this buck was with his buddies and come gray light, like slightest, slightest gray light. That buck is on that highway, peel into a north slope into some pines. And like Justin kind of glazed over, a front came through. And when he <laughs> yeah. tells me the story, this buck is on the highway, head to the pines. Yeah. Wind switches. Justin is glassing and he's able to actually see like some snowflakes. Oh, yeah. We had a full blown storm in the drainage next door and it had just kind of moved through <clears throat> a pocket in the peaks. Yeah. And so you could see, I mean, it's late August. First of September, September second, I think, if I remember right, because at that point in time, you know, our Colorado was still starting their their um, archery hunt the final Saturday in August, and then it was a couple of years or year after that they switched to the second of September as their opening day. But anyway, 
whatever it was, that front came through and you could see it in the drainage next to us and you could see it moving through and then you could see it coming up our drainage and kind of a low ceiling and some of those light, light snowflakes coming down, almost not sleet because sleet's too heavy, just floating around in the sky. And through the binoculars, you could see enough of it coming down and you could see the direction of it shift. And it's only after the fact, right? It takes you a minute to process everything that's happening when the deer stops, just freezes. And then a couple of minutes later, you realize it's got to be because that whole wind situation, he was going off this drainage into his nose, right? Wind in his nose every single morning. Yep. And now that disappeared on him. And in an instant, he just froze. And, and, um, Standing there, I mean, we're sitting there, fortunately, I'm with a friend because making the decision to drop in is a commitment. Mm-hmm. Everyone that's been in the backcountry knows that the elevation that you lose and the and and the likelihood of a successful stock and the grind that you face getting back up out of there, that you're really deciding whether or not you want to make that decision every time that it presents itself, especially on an animal like this where chances are you blow it out and you never see it again, and then you've got to come all the way back out, but having someone there to consult with in that moment was huge. Um, And knowing that we may not see another opportunity like this and just to make it happen. And the fact that he continued to stand there long enough, then ultimately, you know, when I got down in position and found myself 80 yards from him, when he walked out from behind some stuff or kind of walked through some kind of some dense stuff, um, and I range him and he's at 80 yards and then he beds down. Like everything about that morning had changed. Yeah. And the wind stayed in my favor. You know, the things that you can't control, the things that, you know, there's, there's more at play than just you and an animal. Mm-hmm. When the wind keeps going the right direction long enough for all of this to come together. Um, that's the other reason you want, I, I want to be in the back country is because, it puts you in your proper, I puts me in my proper perspective in the whole universe. Yeah. You're really nothing, right? Yeah. And so many things out of your control have to happen, right, for it to work out. And then at the end of it all, if whether it works out or it doesn't, the gratitude that you feel for that moment and for the way it all came together or even the way it didn't come together. Like I've had more blown stocks than successful ones like any other archery hunter. But you still feel an immense amount of gratitude for everything you got to experience in that moment. Um, Because you can't have a whole bunch of other things creeping into your mind. Um, Total tangent here. But I've been up on the Wasatch Front here in warfare hunting years ago. And just watched from a distance on a stock that I had did not want to go in on. Because it was low, like beyond low probability. Right. There was a hunter. There's an animal here, a hunter here that didn't know the animal was there. Another hunter over here trying to make a stock in a way. that Right. And watching people do things from a distance that looked like they were just so out of tune with what was going on around them. I almost felt like they were thinking more about the Instagram story they were going to post mm-hmm. and like playing that out in their mind than they were actually living the situation. It was very curious to me to watch this. And and that's what being in the backcountry and away from everything else, there's nothing else going through your mind in that moment besides the bird that's right next to you here, the way the winds, just everything, right? It's grounding. Yeah, and if, and if you're doing anything else in that moment, and that's one of the reasons why I personally am not on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that, because... I do think that there are people that are in a hunting situation or in a backcountry in an, an, a natural environment where they have the opportunity of a lifetime to just engage in what's around them. And I think they're distracted by how they're going to post this on Instagram. Yeah. And it distracts from the experience they should be having. And I don't want that to happen to me, so I just stay away from it. I definitely think that's a factor in today's hunter. Like, to, to lie and say that I've never thought about that would just be yeah would just be a complete lie that like glassed up a giant bull on general season over the counter hunt you yeah. know and heading in on a stock and 
I'd be lying if I said that I had thought about like, oh man, this is going to make a killer video. Oh man, I'm going to get a lot of likes or comments and I'm going to be, I'm going to get some street cred, you know? And, and it's hard because it's, it's a, it's a positive and negative thing because like my job, right? Well, yeah. Like filming, telling stories, creating content for other people to enjoy and to be inspired and to educate. And then on the other side of the token, it's like, it's detracting or would it be retracting? No, it's it detracting. De- it detracts from the experience. Yeah. From, from me being there, but it, <laughs> it's a three sided coin, I guess there's another side. That's like, I get to relive this yeah. through the video. And I get to see people be inspired and the joy from the video. So it's it's a com- super complex, but I do I do need to work on my mental fortitude when in the zone, just being present and almost just completely putting blinders on. I can't even think about the YouTube video or the Instagram post because this year I had the best tag I've ever had. Yeah. And I think I have a really high probability of killing the biggest mule deer I've ever killed, or at least chasing the biggest mule deer I've ever chased. And in my brain, it's like, okay, I got some new camo, got a new bow, got this, got this, have all these companies supporting me, like wanting some killer content, wanting a killer video. Um, just my team, my teammates, you know, who bought me the tag, yeah. like, want me to have the coolest experience. I, I want to create the best content for them, for the fans that have been like interacting or like pumping me up. I want to just show them that like I didn't take the tag for granted. But at the same time, it's like I need to have blinders on and I need to yeah. just find a deer, watch the deer when the stock is a 90% or higher probability of getting in bow range, go in and execute a solid shot, a solid release. And then all that other stuff can come. But like, it's just, it's funny because like back in wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. Back in like through high school or anything, it was always talked about, right? Like it was a huge goal of mine to be a four time state champion. It was a huge goal of mine to wrestle division one college. And all this stuff was always talked about, you know, I've always wanted to kill 200 inch mule deer, but like the hype of it, almost gets me more in the zone if that makes sense like i feel like i can do a decent job of viewing the goal and the opportunity and taking it for what it is uh for example my senior year going for my fourth state title there had only been 23 other people in the history of the state of utah to be a four-time state champ so i was gonna be number 24 that to go out there and my wrestling coach grabs me by the arm and he's like hey dude like we need you to pin this kid because if you don't our team takes second place but if you pin him our team takes first place and our whole team gets state championship ranks you know and like that's a lot of pressure for a 17 year old kid you know and my whole life wanted to be a four-time state champ and i've heard horror stories of friends and people i know senior year they they choke they're three-time state champ and took second their senior year, you know? So going out there and I don't know, it's almost like you black out or just zone out and pin the kid in 60 seconds and everything was great. Like achieved my goal. Our team got state rings. Like it was awesome. But I tell this story because I always, I always had like the mindset. You got to ride that fine line of like confidence and like arrogance humility's got to be in there sandwiched and i think that correlates with hunting and your style of hunting and the way you talk i think you have like that same tunnel vision that same mindset to where like you know if that deer beds in that spot i will get in boat range that's your confidence yeah your arrogance it's not a bad thing in this case if you write this line your arrogance is if i get within that range there's a high probability that arrow is going through that deer's vitals. And then your humility in the center, there's controllables I can't control. And you're, you're humble to that. Yep. 
So with That's it. with this formula that I've thought up in my brain, it's like, how can you take that formula, confidence, arrogance, and humility, and make that the focal point of every stock or every hunt or every shot opportunity? And the main reason, like, I want to talk to you today, I mean, we're going to dive down some rabbit holes on some yeah. gear and some hunting tactics, but like... You have sealed the deal on a lot of big mule deer, handfuls, and I just want to get in your brain a little bit. Like when you're going on these stocks, you're hunting with a couple of killers, first of all, that know a hunt or a stock opportunity and can help you like guide you with hand motions or game bags or anything. Like I might want to dive into that if you're willing to spill the beans on your yeah uh, guiding in technique, but like. Your mindset, you watch this buck for a few days, and not even the Gordon buck. Let's say another big buck you've killed, and you're watching him. I'm sure you watch most of your bucks you kill several days, and you're like, if he beds under that cliff, it's go time. Is that? Am I right to like put put you in that? I I put together dream scenarios like that. So here's the interesting thing is I've never actually had the deer bed where I want it to bed, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I know what you're saying. I want to go back, though, because your perspective, we're, we're more than 25 years apart, right? Yeah. So your perspective of your generation, I totally get it. And it's interesting for me to listen to where you come from as it relates to social media, content, and how that blends into your hunting experience. Because for me... It can't blend in. Yeah. It has to be, but I don't, I'm not saying that it couldn't be that way for other people. Now, I have some pretty strong beliefs about how to get the most out of your time in the backcountry. And I don't know that digital and, and other media forms, because I've been down that road where I've been with people where we were trying to storyboard out certain shots that you want to get before and after the stock and the hunt and everything like that. And I only had to have that experience a couple of times to realize that that took away from the hunting experience for me. Mm -hmm. I think it's unique individuals and probably there, there's, there's definitely a generational thing here where people can incorporate the social media and the content creation and collection into the overall hunting experience. And, but I can't do it. And I think there are people that want to do it that can't. I think it's a unique skill set because what I was describing earlier you could probably in a couple of weeks go on the Wasatch front, pick a pocket, you'll know where they are, and watch a dozen different hunters around the same one or two deer and spend a little bit of time behind the binoculars and you'll watch who's trying to Alrighty. act out their storyboard or act out their Instagram post and how it's it, sorry, yeah. sorry. Let's see. All righty, folks. Sorry about that. That is a, a technical difficulty. Um camera overheated for a second which is not ideal it seems like every time a new piece of equipment or camera body or iphone comes out the previous model starts taking a crap so we we're talking justin you could watch a group of hunters on the front and just mentally they're not you checked can, in yeah you can see people that are that are they're playing out kind of this Instagram post versus just being in the moment and stalking an animal. Um, some people can do that. Some people can't, yeah. right? The moral of the story is we're all back there for different reasons, but it's also, you have to find out what is authentic for you and what is the experience you're looking for. And I think it's a unique skill set to be able to think about content and almost create content on the fly versus hunting and then taking the content after the fact and creating whatever you want. Yeah. And then there's mine requires no skill set. All I've got to do is be in the back country and just enjoy the moment. Right. But that's why I'm not going to have any content created around what I do. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely like you say generational. I I had Instagram my sophomore year of high school. Like I, it was always 
yeah. just integrated with hunting. And I think what's unique about Hush is <laughs> though me and Logan try to get the guys to storyboard and to really get a detailed shot list, it just never works out for us because we're like, we don't know what the heck's going to happen on this hunt. Yeah. We don't know what the trial's going to be. We don't know what the focal point's going to be. We don't know if we're going to get in a flipping car accident, hit a deer, you know, and that's the whole story. We got to hike in from here because our truck broke down or we don't know what it's going to be. And I think there's a healthy like medium there to where all these hunts we go on. Though as a cameraman and an editor, it makes my life really a lot more difficult just filming everything because you don't know how you're going to tell the story. You don't know where the story is going to morph or where the story is going to go. And I've been on enough of these hunts to kind of think I know, but right when you think you know, it, it just, you get humbled. So it's, it's definitely a challenge, but it's kind of a fun challenge because every hunt's so different. And this is like, this is where I wanted to dive in with you is like, you've been able to repeat success several times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a fluke when you see Justin Gordon send you a picture of another 200 inch mule deer he killed. You know, it's, I, it's almost expected at this point for me. Like, and I know you might, I know you don't feel that pressure because you've told me so many times, like, dude, I'm not afraid to eat a tag. Like I don't have to kill a deer to get my fix. Yeah. And I think that is such a rad feeling because I've had the opportunity to talk to Eric or BMAC or any of these guys or even myself where we have some of these better tags and the pressure from those better tags is like, oh man, like I want to, <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. That was good. Go. You drew a Henry's tag, right? Yeah. You drew a Henry's Mountain deer tag, which is one of, it, at the time, it was like the best deer tag to have in the state. It was 2016. It was good. And you knew of a couple big deer. Oh, I have a good video. <laughs> and, Phenomenal deer. And you found another big deer, in, let's say a less desirable unit in another state. And you basically just ate your Henry's tag and was like, God, oh, this deer is better. I'm going to go over here. Right? Like, and It wasn't a better deer from a score perspective, but it was just a different experience. It, Honestly talk about if evolution in, in a perspective. Yeah. Today I probably would have handled that a little differently because it's not every day. I was a little bit arrogant using that term with the, the, uh, or optimistic yeah. that I could find 200 plus deer on the regular, right? 200 inch plus animals on the, on the regular. Yeah. And so I was thinking, I, I don't like side-by-sides. I hate dust. I'm yeah. going to backpack. On the Henry Mountains, I have to leave camp every day, get in a quad side-by-side, -side, drive around over to where I'm going to hike in, find the deer. Just a, just a different experience. And at the moment, I just wanted to be in the backcountry. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to be near anything with a motor. Uh, it was... And so, in hindsight, you know, I haven't had a chance to, to hunt a deer like that. I should send you some video that you could you could add into this yeah. of that deer that I was hunting on the Henry's. Isn't it like 220? He ended up scoring um, Hardhorn, a, a, a rifle hunter from Vermont or somewhere, uh -huh. killed him yeah, late, late in the season with a rifle. And I think it Hardhorned out at 228 or 232, uh -huh. something like that. So... <laughs> Looked amazing. I, I've got film of him in the velvet, and I got within 100 yards of him. And then um, I think it was the second or third day, I was like, yeah, it's, so I knew where he was. I knew where he lived. Yeah. And um, given him five to seven days, we would have had him in a position that I could kill him. But I think it was the day three that I pulled out and drove to a backcountry hunt where I had to hike in, I think, 12 miles to my camp and... But um, I wouldn't do that today. The opportunity to hunt a deer that big just doesn't come along as frequently as I thought it would back in 2016. Yeah. Um, but at the time, it's just part of the evolution. And still today, I mean, if I think of the tags that I, that I would really want, 
you know, there's some decent hunts that have cropped up where you've had fires or you've had different management protocol in different in, in units. And now we've got some units with some big mule deer in Utah that in 2016, when I was hunting the Henrys, you never would have even heard that that unit name come up. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, after Sean Morgan killed that buck that he did down on that unit, everyone knows that that unit exists, right? Yeah. But I still don't know that that's where I'd want to spend my time. Now, you get a buck with a 230-inch mainframe and some extras, and it changes your mind on where you want to spend your time. But, um, yeah, the Henry Mountains, that was an interesting experience. and I, Just one of those. Son of a gun. That's good. That that just tells me that we were dragging on to. All righty, ladies and gentlemen. Technical difficulty. Number moving three. on. The point of the more the moral of the story was that again, in part of discovering what really drives you, is it is it really just big deer or is it the experience? I, as some a lot of folks have probably heard me say this, but you know that Henry's Mountain Year taught me that it's the experience. Yeah, and and kind of in segue to your current hunting style, let's kind of walk through your evolution. So started backpacker, whatever you carry on your back. Yep. Then goats, horses, llamas, like some stock animals. Yeah. Like, full, full circle on that too. Um, I would say that was my biggest takeaway coming out of the mountain in 2022. I, I was... The whole time, even hiking into the hunt, driving, you know, you have, it's it's just an, a cool experience to be able to step away, to be in a position where you can step away from work, take a vacation, having a family that supports the idea of being away for that, you know, several days. And so the drive down, the hike in, the entire, throughout the entire hunt, there was something that I was trying to wrap my head around that just wasn't fitting for me. And what I came to realize last year, we had gone from having a horse packer go in and drop camp to, well, we want to be more mobile because we would drop camp and then we'd always have three to five days, sometimes seven days, and we would be bivying out and going in different areas. So we wanted to be more mobile. So we tried the pack goats. The pack goats were awesome because they could go anywhere you wanted to go. Yeah. Um, but we got word from the fishing game that they feel like there's potentially some things that can be, you know, disease can be transmitted from pack goats to wild sheep populations. And so I think there's still a dust up between goat packing people and because there's no actual data to prove it, but there's a chance. Yeah. Right. So we actually only did that one year. And then heard that the fishing game would prefer that we didn't. So we bailed on the pack goats and started using llamas. And um, that brings me to this past year. With the llamas, there's I can't think of an animal that I've killed that the llamas got to. I've always had to pack the animal basically to a trail. Mm-hmm. Okay, Llamas can go through some stuff, but... <clears throat> not where you kill animals typically. Yeah. Or where I've ended up killing animals. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got to pack them up and out or around and over. I've got to get them to a trailhead, which is better than packing them all the way to the truck. Yeah. The llamas are saving me 10 to 12 miles of bat, yeah. even if it is on a trail. Um, so they weren't as mobile. It was still kind of a drop camp, base camp type of a situation. And what I kind of pinpointed last year, we'll see how it goes this year, is that the llamas, gradually I had kind of gotten lazy to where there were more things going in with llamas. I had a cot, I had a camp chair, two tents, one base camp tent, one one tent to go bivy out. Um, Some steaks. Yeah, not quite, but smoked salmon. Like, can you imagine a whole side of smoked salmon after you've been in the backcountry for six days? Gold. Yeah. Crackers, Triscuits up the, you know, just stuff that you would never, you couldn't ever backpack in. You wouldn't want to. And um, I just came to the realization that I had gradually started to seek comfort in the backcountry, but the backcountry that I had always, 
looked for was to get out of comfort, right? Mm -hmm. To be in an uncomfortable situation, whether it was physically, mentally, or emotionally. And at some point over nine to 14 days, you're going to encounter all three and sometimes at the same time. And the llamas, with everything that I had started to take into the backcountry, made things more and more comfortable. And, that, and I realized the reason I wasn't f- enjoying myself or, or getting out of the experience what I had looked for or what I had in the past is because I was looking in the wrong places. Right, um, all of those comforts didn't make the experience, and in fact, I, I I started going back and looking through my journal. It's like I haven't been spending as many days away from base camp as I did historically. Mm-hmm. Right, oh, well, I'll do one or two nights out over there, or no nights out over there. I'll just go out and back. I'll do an extra long hike, but I'll sleep better and I'll be back at camp with all this stuff. Right. Um, None of which actually made for a, a more fulfilling experience. None of which necessarily made me more successful in the backcountry. And ultimately, it was what brought me to this kind of full circle where this year I've been back to all the little things to take weight out of my pack, not taking llamas in, and uh, just kind of going back to that experience that's f- maybe physically more uncomfortable but certainly going to put me in a better place mentally and emotionally, uh, going to give me the experience that I want in the back country mm-hmm. and probably going to make me more mobile because genuinely I'll have everything on my back. Um, and uh, we'll see how it works out. I don't know. I, because success really doesn't come from filling the tag, but I do think that I'll um, probably see more animals this way. I'll be willing to cover more country if I have to. So it's interesting to go over, you know, a 12 year period to go from finding ways to get more things into the back country to finally realizing that the that comfort isn't what I was looking for. I'm actually going there to get away from all the comfort that we enjoy every day. Right? I uh you saying <laughs> saying that is like wow, I can clearly see from even hunts last year. Hunts where it was bivy style versus hunts that we had a giant team lodge trailer with air conditioning, comfortable bed, refrigerator, Wi-Fi, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> like the hunts, just the contrast of my memories of those hunts. Oh, yeah. Polar opposite. Like one of my favorite hunts from last year was camaraderie, a hunt that me and Eric and Chad Mendez and Shed Crazy, we were all on and we had a horse drop camp but then eric and chad and i end up finding a big bull five miles from the drop camp and we end up spending five days in there with whatever we carried off our back and we only packed food and water for about a day or two thinking it was going to be an overnight recon and we end up spending five and me and eric jamming in my big agnes copper spur you know just a two-person tent and him and i sleeping shoulder to shoulder in that tent with every layer of clothing we had on a snowstorm came in melting snow over a fire on our jet boil because we're rationing fuel in our jet boils and eating half a peak refuel instead of the full like man that is we didn't punch a tag on that hunt yeah but man was that a hunt right was that an experience and we had hunts last year where we killed giant bulls big bulls but we had a furnace and a soft bed and running water every night. And I, I look back and I'm like, yeah, that was sick. Would I do it again? Maybe. But like just thinking of some of these hunts that I'm like, man. And that's like my deer hunt this year. Mm-hmm. I am so torn because just the way this mountain range is laid out. I'm like, I, I could have big team lodge trailer, soft queen size bed every night, you know. My dad cooking ribs and chicken, anything I want, and be able to have that comfort. Or I could sleep bivy sal and run these ridges and be so mobile and never think twice about what's over the next ridge and if I have the energy to do it or the desire to do it because I'm already up there. Yeah. But it's a double-edged sword because you're like, man, do I really want to put my scent and my... 
like just the noise and disturbance on the top of these basins when I can see all these basins from down low. But then it's like, what's on the backside of those basins? Like what's in the hidey holes? So, I mean, I got a lot more scouting to do and time will tell, you know, wherever I find the big deer. But uh, it's definitely interesting. I definitely see where you're coming from. Like there is an added, what's the word? An added element to a hunt that cannot be replicated from being a little uncomfortable. I've had people in the backcountry with me that they'll never do it again. And they're totally fine with that. They're like, I would rather sit in the duck blind freezing my butt off than come out here in the backcountry. Uh-huh. And to me, that's baffling. That's what's so cool is everyone has their thing. It's different for everyone. Um, and And I'm sitting there in the middle of what I think is the most beautiful country in the world to have someone say, no, I'll never do this again. This isn't my style. It's mind blowing to me. Yeah. And just like, but then at the same time, I'm grateful. I'm like, man, I'm glad more people don't like this Yeah, because I don't want them back here. Um, the, the big variable that you laid out in your hunt this year is when you mentioned your dad. And that's the one thing going back to my, cause my dad passed away this past um, winter. And um, the, the, memory that I have about the Henry Mountains is that he was able to go down there with me because we were camping next to the truck, right? Um, And we were in a side-by-side. And so having him there with me for those three days, um, and that's the variable when you say, I have a chance to have my dad cook for me every night versus running ridges. Yeah. When you bring that variable in where you can be with family and create some memories, those are things that have to be taken advantage of because they don't come around very often. That's some wisdom there. Yeah. 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 I wish, um, my only problem is when I tell my boys, ask them if they want to go hunting, I've kind of created a bad situation because I was no different than they are at their age, but I'm at a different point in what I really enjoy. So I say, hey, do you guys want to go hunting? And the first question is, well, how far do we have to hike? Because they've never been with me when we didn't spend an entire day hiking in and then we hunt the next morning sort of thing. And um, this year I'm going to try to get my 13-year-old out on some, hopefully we can find, I don't know how to find animals next to the road, right? (laughs) (laughs) But I've got to get him out and get him some experience that he enjoys Um, because that's that's the one thing that... um, yeah, as much as I love the backcountry, maybe I love it so much because it it does cut most of the people out. I don't know why. I don't know why people wouldn't suffer physically to go enjoy that, but there's a part of me that's glad that they don't. Yeah. So kind of moving into the next little topic I want to talk to. You're a gear snob like I am, and I I love that about you. I love the amount of preparation and thought and energy that goes into what's going in your backpack. So I know you don't have your whole gear list in front of you or any stats or uh, what's the word specs on weights or anything, but for those listeners or those people watching, what are three things Justin Gordon never goes mule deer hunting without? Three things that you're like, okay, this will always be in my backpack and has been for the last two or three years or something exciting that you're like, this is replacing an outdated piece of gear. And it doesn't, I don't even like bow excluded, right? boots excluded. Right. Like. So I'm probably different than a lot of folks in this regard. Although I, I don't know. I don't know how most people feel about this, but the tent. Yeah. Um, I'm a, f- I'm a full, I'm not a, a, what do they call? I'm not, I don't sleep on the ground. Yeah. I have a full, what? I can't even think right now, but I, I run a full tent, right? Yeah, I don't run like the, little I, I don't run the fast and light tarp option where I'm sleeping on the ground. Um, floorless. Yeah. Floorless shelter. The, there's, so I always run a full shelter. And for a lot of years, my favorite, just because primarily the poles are on the outside, it pitched quickly and easily 
and I could throw all my gear in and keep it out of the rain and pitch the tent, and that was the Kuyu, right? Their Mountain Star or whatever it is, their Mountain Star two-person tent. I ran that for years and years because I thought it was um, from an ease. It was heavier than I wanted to carry, but I don't. I've done bivy sacks. I've done floorless shelters. I've done tarps. Something's going to happen where that's not that fun to set up or it's not doing what you want it to do. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, there's you, there's going to be a time where it's raining or it's windy or you're just stuck in the tent all day. Yeah, and, and people will say work on your field craft and you can pitch a tarp to, to do everything you need it to do. Yeah, you can. And it's still not going to be as nice as a fully enclosed shelter that you can just crawl into and get away from everything. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that I've So I've what just, tent are you running this year? Uh, this year I'm trying something new. Because, um, and I hope they're like, I, I haven't done any research on them. I hope that they're a pro hunting group, but it's just this little guy out of Canada that created a tent that I think is probably one of the most well laid out, easy to pitch, same concept, right? I can, I can stake it out, throw all my gear underneath it, and then put my trekking poles up, and I've got massive amounts of room for one person. I'm sub three pounds, and I'm not even using the the um, Cuban fiber version. If I were using the Cuban fiber version, I'd be sub two pounds on a two person shelter. It's the Durston. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I recently saw a buddy talking about that. It's pretty slick. And as f- you can look far and wide and not find anything that I think is as well laid out as that shelter. Okay. They got a couple options. Yeah. So the pro is their, that's their Cuban fiber. The X-Mid Pro 2, or yeah. you Pro 1? No, I'm not doing the Pro, dude. I don't trust Cuban fiber yet. The way they bond that stuff together. Are you doing a one or two person? Two, going for the extra weight. Man, I can put everything in there. Are you the mid two or mid solid? Mid the, two solid. the two, because the solid's heavier and you don't need it, in my opinion. Dang. Higher put, and you can you can kind of vary the pitch depending on the on the, the ground and what but see what I don't know about these guys you look at the price point of that shelter yeah it's a phenomenal shelter at that price point it is amazing like, I have so we're those just listening we're on this website and we have no affiliation with this company I just wanted to see how this tent was set up yeah man 300 bucks for this two person it says fly only but uh I'm sure you can get a clip-in floor. No, so, it comes for three hundred dollars. It comes with the, the. They're just showing it fly only there. Oh. So, so go to like go to that one right there. So for three hundred bucks, it comes with the okay. the the internal mesh. So are these? So check this out. Tent poles like diagonal from each other. Yeah, they're offsetting, and so you have this 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 ridge line that oh, runs kind go. of on a diagonal. Yeah, you can see that. The amount of space in that thing is amazing and what you'll notice is where those are pitched you actually have full access right there's nothing in, uh, in your way and then on the other side right here this vestibule is huge okay compared to my old vestibule backpack and boot storage and hugely usable compared to any other vestibule i've ever had so and, yeah it's um and i hope this guy's not some anti-hunter because then i'll have to burn the tent but right now, I'm pretty stoked about it. Yeah, man. Okay. Thurston, I like that. Uh, I'm running um, the new... Let's see. I'm pretty stoked about this tent this year. Oh, yeah. So, here was my thing. I was so torn because these guys are hunt-specific. Yeah. But you look at my price point, right? Nobody's giving me this stuff for free. You look at my price point between the added the insert, doing the whole thing for a two-person... Right. And when you crawl inside of that with that thing in the middle, yep. the usable space in that, we should pitch these side by side because you have this thing. Yeah. It's, I haven't got this new version, but I got the half. Oh, yeah. You got the half insert? The half insert. Dude, I like that. So, I mean, it's going to be a one person, but I'm going to have, if those watching can see where the second sleeping pad is, is going to be a giant vestibule. Yeah. Which I love. I love being able to climb in, sit on my pad and sit with my boots in my vestibule and not have to try and take my boots off outside the tent and climb in. Yep. I mean, guys, my my big Agnes copper spur platinum, 
I got from Black Ovis five years ago has been bomb proof. And I mean, that tent's lightweight, it's freestanding, it's a huge one person tent, double vestibules. I mean, the thing is legit, but I think it's six or 700 bucks and the floor is like paper thin. I've got, I've got tenacious tape all over it from little holes and stuff. You have to pack a ground cloth under yeah. a floored shelter, which is just another eight ounces, 10 ounces. And it's. Here's the thing about Big Agnes, which I've liked them, but they'll rot out in the high altitude sun so fast. Yeah. Uh, well, when I say so fast, relative to other shelters that I've used. And I have been caught out in multiple times. This is why I went to the Kuyu Mountain Star was because I had been caught out multiple times pitching a tent in a downpour and I've got to pitch my tent and then get my rain fly over the top of it. Yeah. Right. With every big Agnes. That's why I went away from that. But I'm, I don't know. We need to pitch these. I, I want to pitch it side by side. The useful space in that tent is, and it's got a unique enough kind of footprint and layout that I'm really excited about the way it works. I'm trying to see. Oh, here's the specs. So with complete package, 39.4 ounces, and that's the heavier model. Yeah. That, with the stuff sack, the inner, the fly, the stakes, um, and the floor. Yeah, I weighed mine. And being a small shop, this guy's pretty dialed into his specs. He's not... He's not... He's not faking anything. Budging anything. I weighed mine when I got it. So, 39 ounces. Yeah, and uh, this... The Argali is 19 ounces, but I don't know that that's with the floor. That doesn't include your... Uh, because if you go down and you include your insert... Yeah. Some of your other stuff... Yeah, I'm sure with the stakes and your stakes and your floor and your pole, but I'll, I had he's got those Arcali trekking poles with a like a female to female adapter yeah. that turns two trekking poles into your center pole. Pretty rad. Um, I'm excited to run it. Like I've ran teepees before. Not a huge teepee fan, but they were floorless teepees. And dude, I'm not a huge floorless guy, but with my half insert, I'm super stoked to try the stove option. Yeah. Because it, you have the luxury of a floor list to be able to run a stove, but then the luxury of having a floor where you're sleeping. I don't know, man. I'm excited to try it. But uh, That's the one I was going to purchase. And because you and everyone else I know is buying an Argali, I almost purchased the Durston more so that I could compare and contrast. That's, that's smart. So what's another... <laughs> so the other, the other thing that I just trying to think because really I haven't changed anything in my pack for I'll bet you seven years. I changed the pack itself. Yeah, what are you running now? Um, so of all the packs that I've ran and it's so funny because in the, the year that I killed that big deer I had a mystery ranch mm -hmm. and right up until that point and even when I was running that I had a the pack that I liked better was my um my Ku Kifaru. Kifaru, okay. Yeah. Um, and then just recently, on a whim, decided again, because everyone I know has a Kifaru. Yep. I was like, I want to try something. And no one, even though I think they're fairly popular, what's the name of that guy out of uh, out of Idaho? Mm. They do a pack and it's built right there in Idaho. Everly Stock or EXO? EXO. Yeah. So because everyone I know has a Kifaru, I was like, this EXO thing, their new V4 or whatever. Yeah, they've got K4. one of those. I love that thing. So I've been running it all summer. I've got a 30 pound sandbag and I've got a 40 pound sandbag. And sometimes I'll put both of them in it together, do a weighted rock and everything. And um, that's a really nice backpack. Super sick backpack. I'm running the K4 with the 5000. You guys run EXO. We run EXO. We ran okay. EXO forever. That's, so that's right. I borrowed yours to decide it. You I borrowed, borrowed your, K3. your K3 to decide whether or not I wanted to do it. So I know it's like, well, yeah, you have to have a backpack, the same as you have to have a bow. But what backpack you have, I've found makes a huge difference. It does, undoubtedly. Like, I've ran Mystery Ranch, I've ran Kafaru, and I've ran um, EXO. And they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. But this new K4, man, I mean pretty dang impressive so it's a light pack 
when compared to your Mystery Ranch and compared to your Kafaru. Yeah. I don't know the exact specs. I could look it up real quick, but I mean. Mystery Ranch is a perfect pack for my scouting trips. Yeah. Because I'm never heavy. Um, it, it finds its failure point in pictures like the one that you had up there where it's freaking front and center. Um, it, it doesn't do well under heavy loads in my opinion, but yeah. that's just my opinion. They make a lot of cool gear and they make a lot of cool gear for good people. Yeah. Guys that are out there fighting fires and things like that. But, you know, you load an animal and certainly an elk, it's no fun. It's never any fun, but that pack makes it less fun. So I'm excited about that this year. The EXO is something that uh, for me is a, I think it'll be a bit of a game changer. It was that or going back to a Kefaru. Yeah. Like I said, everyone has a Kefaru, so I'm excited to try it out. Um, what is that third piece that like, I'm not a trekking pole person. Me and you were touching on it earlier. I mean, months ago. For me, it's a sleeping pad. Sleeping pads, oh, yeah. your sleep system. Bag, pad, pillow. Yeah. I think is some of the most overlooked. Real quick before we jump to sleep systems, uh, Kefaru K- or XO K4 frame and 5,000 cubic inch bag. That's the one I have. Five pounds, 13 ounces. Yeah. Um, Kefaru 44 mag, which is fairly comparable. 3.7 pounds. That's just the bag though. Yeah. If you add the frame to that, you're pushing, you got to be pushing seven plus pounds. I seven think. plus pounds. I, I, I don't know. I, I think you're probably. And they feel great. Um, I think everyone's that harness that. Uh, Let's see. I don't know. Between Stone Glacier, XO and Kefaru. It's really just what bag you want to run. I, it, you're splitting. Now, I could get into some details about the K4 that I find next level compared to the other packs that I've had. So six pound on the mystery ranch. So yeah, I, yeah, uh, the XO's the lightest that I've seen. And and I'm not saying that because we're sponsored by XO, but I've ran all three packs and I've noticed it's the lightest. I don't know if these people are, see, kind of like the... Um, Durston. I don't want to talk too much about them because I don't know if I like them or not as individuals, yeah. what they stand for. But the details behind this K4 that I'm getting into, the more I run it, like when I'm rucking and scouting this summer, yeah, it's pretty good. It's like, <laughs> well, you you know something has been thought out Yeah, when we've had prototypes for almost a year and a half, two years, yeah, and they take your feedback. And alter things. And I mean, the pack's super legit. So moving to sleep systems. Yeah, you and I did talk about that. I'm and glad you bring it up. We had a deep dive. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who might be bored of the gear talk, this this all ties into killing more animals. It really does. And I already can just see Eric rolling his eyes or yawning when I start talking about <laughs> ounces or uh, maybe the R value of a sleeping pad versus another. Yeah. But I've also seen Eric not get any sleep at night <laughs> and be completely useless the next morning. No matter how hard-headed or determined that kid is, he's just, he's had sleepless nights because of pad failures or being cold or being a side sleeper and just not being comfortable. And I mean... Pad failures. Pad failures. I will tell you one pad that I've never had fail. What's the name of it? Thermarest. <laughs> yeah, the Thermarest. Yeah. So I've been, I've had, I, I haven't had a Big Agnes pad not fail in the last 15 years, period. Yeah. And I hate, I mean, pains me to say that, but I can go through every Big Agnes. And I still have, I mean, I was able to patch them up. Yeah. My kids use them when we're doing one or two nights, right, out. But I won't put my hunt on a Thermarest or, 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 or on a Big Agnes so I've had the same Thermarest, I think, for the last four, four and a half years. Do you know the model off the top of your head? Without a failure. Yeah, it's loud as hell. I hate how loud it is. Is it the Neo Air? I, I, yeah. And it, or? Yeah, and it's super, and I got the shorter one because I was into ounce counting at the moment. And while it's still great, my 13-year-old's going to inherit it because it's really light. Yeah. And it doesn't fail. And I just 
kind of upgraded to the latest and greatest, more quiet, this guy here. The NXT. Yeah. And it definitely is quieter than my old one. Like my, my old one, I wear earplugs in the back country anyway, but you didn't have an option. You had to wear earplugs because even me, when I would just move at night, my old thermo rest would wake me up, but it never 12, failed. 12 ounces. Yeah. I got the bigger one because I wanted- The regular uh, wide 16 ounces. Yeah. That's what I wanted. I decided I'm going regular and wide. What was the one I decided I needed to buy? <laughs> it was the, it was their like heaviest a, one. Like a 24 ounce sleeping pad. And I'm like- Guys, I- You don't need like- I'm not lying when I say the last time I had a solid night's rest- on a sleeping pad, I can't even remember when. So I have this whole thing uh, in a go back up printed somewhere. It's the no. I have the pillow. I want the Nemo pillow. It's like a um, a soft pillow on top. Underneath, it's your uh, blow, blow up. up. So it has like memory foam, two inches of memory foam, mm -hmm. and then inflatable underneath it. Yep. Done a lot of YouTube university studies on that. And then this pad, I decided, oh, where is this thing? I'm going to find this thing. Uh, yeah, it's the Max there. right there, isn't it? I think so. It's got like an R6 value, which is ridiculous. It's not No, one. it's not that one. An R6 value because I always get cold. I'm to the point now where I carry a zero degree sleeping bag that weighs like five and a half pounds, dude. It is not, and I love, I love Black Ovis to death, like, but their sleeping bag, and they didn't make it to be an ultralight backpacking pad. I, I understand that, but it is, uh, it is not light, the one I'm currently running. Man, where is this? Xtherm, I think that's the one. Yeah. Yep, R7.3. Okay, here it is, guys. I'm gonna do the regular wide. So one pound four ounces. So it's only it's only four ounces heavier than the one you're getting, but it has three more R values or whatever you call it. It's an R seven point three and yours was an R four. So that's what I'm gonna be running, guys, is <laughs> Thermarest Neo Air X Therm NXT. I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh I'm a side sleeper. And I get cold. So I'm going with a thick pad with the R value, the highest in the hunting industry or backpacking. Industry. And it won't fit and it won't fail you. And a thermarest from the, the reviews I've heard pretty dang tough. Yeah. R value 7.3. So that's it. Sleeping pads. Are you side sleeper, side sleeper at all? Are you back sleeper? You said you wear earplugs. Do you wear eye covers? Like, no, but I, I like practice all year sleeping on my back, just so that now like literally I, so I sleep on my back, and um, keep everything pretty low key that way. But I am, I've been playing around with the uh, the quilt from Stone Glacier. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure I'm sold on it. I think that 99.9% .9 of the time it would be the best solution. That. 0.1% of the time when I'm not sure I want it in my backpack is if I have to do some heat retention. Like if I'm in a bad situation, I need to dry clothes out or do something else. I don't know that a sleep system with a quilt is going to, based on my ex limited experience with it so far, I've just, I've only had it for three months, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I haven't gone out and thrown myself in a river and tried to dry my clothes out overnight sleeping in it. Yep. But anecdotally, I will tell you, I don't think that that's going to help me retain heat and dry clothes and do the things that I would do in a sleeping bag. So what sleeping bag have you ran in the past? For the last 10 or 12 years, I've ran the, um, the Marmot Helium. And still to this day, from a weight to warmth ratio, you can match it, but you can't beat it. It's 29 ounces at a 15 degree rating. Um, like, and that, that's a 10 or 12 year old sleeping bag. Yeah. Like you, you go look high and low, find a 29 ounce sleeping bag that has that much fill weight and, ha and, and has the warmth rating that, that it does. And, and it, 
in my opinion, it exceeds its warmth rating. So 15 degree, and I've used it for all sorts of things because I can unzip it if it's warmer, but I have that extra, uh, you know, if I need it. I really want this quilt to be the thing, um, but like I said, there's that that situation that you may find yourself in yeah, where it's not going to work. And it's pretty heavy for what it is. Yeah, um, pound, six ounces. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's for a six, five... It can oh, yeah. hold up to a 6.5 dude. I feel like if they had a shorter option, you could probably cut four or five ounces off that. And I was kind of, I, w- I was excited about all of that because it just gives you room to throw things down in the foot box to, to warm them up or to dry them out at night or what have you. But uh, I'm torn. I'm going to take it on the rest of my scouting trips this year. Don't know if it's going to make it into the backpack for, you know, the actual hunt because on a scouting trip, I can turn around and walk out. Yep. But when I'm, planning on being gone for nine to 14 days. I don't want a sleeping bag, not being able to dry me out to be the reason that I, that I come out early. Yep. Um, so it's just minimal things like that. And the, look, the Marmot helium 12 years in properly laundered, still going strong. I'm sure it doesn't have its loft that it once did, but um, that's it. I think the sleep system, you pointed it out earlier. You touched on it with Eric. It's worth a little extra weight. I've tried the super light. Op- options. I've got a 40 degree rated sleeping bag mm-hmm. that even in August, I've gotten really cold in that sleeping bag, even with my down layers on. Right. So I just won't chance it. Uh, I still have a whole sleep system, which includes my down, you know, my three quarter down pants and my puffy and all of those things that are always in the backpack. Uh, whether I'm glassing or no matter what, you've got that you've got your puffy and your rain so that you could probably make it out overnight a few nights if you had to and do some things. But um, certain things that I've decided I won't skip on, skimp on. And that's why this, this quilt is a question mark still for me. Yeah. And I mean, this, this podcast turned a year kind of quick, but like, I can't stress enough guys. I think last year I hunted, I was away from home Upwards of 95 days last fall. Yeah. 95 days. And I would say 70 of those days were spent in a sleeping bag and a pad, whether that's in a trailer on the floor or out in the woods or out in a tent bivy style. 75 days last year and never saw more than five hours of sleep. So here's the, let me just, because the other thought of that is, then you got the normal guy like me. I can't afford, I'm lucky that I can afford nine to 14 days, right? On a, on a mule deer hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully I get to go out a few more days other than that. But the flip side of that for me is even if I don't have the, the, the opportunity, like my dream, like I said, is just basically spend from July 1st till September 30th in the back country. And until that comes true, there's still... The archery hunt for me, and it, it has to be archery, I, I don't find the same fulfillment in rifle, right? The reason I get so much enjoyment out of it is because it, it is a pursuit that goes beyond the nine or 10 days that I have a tag in my pocket during the season, right? The procurement of the right gear, the time to go scouting and spend time in the backcountry without a bow, without a tag, testing the gear and all of this is just part of the overall experience. It's for me, it makes the hunting season three months long. Yep. Right. And I, I need that little bit of distraction. It doesn't consume me, but it's enough of a distraction and enough of a pastime, if you will, that I can spend a little bit of time each week and get away. Some people play golf. I genuinely don't have time to play golf the way I'd like to, those types of things. But being able to focus on, go out, sleep in the backyard, just go for a little overnight or up on the mountain with my kids, um, just to test gear and, and play around with things. To me, it extends the overall hunt. Yeah. And so, yeah, gear isn't the end all be all, but it's, it's, a, it's a part of the overall experience for me. It is for sure. And I mean, something I learned, I after this year's shed hunting, I did a deep dive. I mean, I was eating melatonin gummies every night, sleeping with like 
white noise speaker on my phone. <laughs> like literally just like give me some sleep to where I came to the conclusion I fall asleep on my back. I'm sure there's a lot of people when out camping fall asleep on their back. That if you have a narrow or a regular sleeping pad and your hands are below your hips oh, when yeah. sleeping on your back, that is an unnatural position for the human body. And that is the leading factor of not being able to get good rest sleeping on your back. And that's something that's never talked about. It's like, wait, wait, why is just not every sleeping pad a wide pad? Like, yeah. okay, it weighs an extra two ounces, but I get 50% better sleep at night. Okay, give me those two ounces. I'll leave a Snickers bar at, back at the trailhead. You know, that's my two ounces. And it's like, this is not talked about. And I'm sure I'm not the only person out there that has sleepless nights. And it's not because I'm scared or nervous. The best sleep I got all last year was in Alaska with the meat pole 10 feet from my cot. And there was grizzly bears. We had tracks and could hear them at night. And I slept the best out there. And I was on a cot with a foam pad, you know, <laughs> and my hip, hands weren't below my hips. But I mean, the thing I'm getting at here is like, this stuff may seem like a bonus or seem as fluff or just extras. But I'm telling you guys, 95 days last fall, 95. And that's not an exaggeration. My wife kept tally because she holds it over my head sometimes. 95 days. And I just had stuff that, oh, it's good enough. Like, oh, it was a cheaper option. Or, oh, like Eric gave me this pad because my other pad popped. Big Agnes. And I was just like, come on. Like, this is the season that I am going to invest in a proper sleep system. And who knows? It may not fix I can't, it. I can't wait to hear the report but back. It can't, it can't hurt. Right. It cannot hurt. Yeah. And I've had, I mean, I'm, I feel old for being 25 years old. <laughs> I've had brain surgery, three knee surgeries, you know, shoulder surgery, hernia surgeries. And like my, my, <laughs> I can't, I need a good pillow. Like with the brain surgery, my neck was fused. Like I need a good pillow. And I always just skimp, dude. I just take my puffy coat, roll it up in a, one of my t-shirts to use as a pillowcase and a yeah. stuff sack. And that works, but it's not the best option. So there's something that the llamas took in for me last year that they won't be around to take in this year that I'm, I've played around with it and I'm still planning on it because I have, I have a version of the memory foam and the, and the blow up pillow. I have the little X pillow. Yep. Um, those things just suck at night. They do. Right? Sorry about that. You're good. That. So I, but here's what I took in last year. The little my pillow. Oh, yeah. The mini my pillow. My daughter has one. Yeah, well. Still it? Yeah, that's a game. Like, I have one of those. Yeah, the inflatable ones suck. They slide out unless you have a pocket in your sleeping bag. And mine has memory foam on it and the whole thing. I'm just here to tell you the weight penalty difference between that, and that's probably lighter than mine because mine's ancient. And... Yeah, it's nine ounces. I can't believe that I'm that my 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 pillow. Now, the volume of my pillow is a little bit unruly because it you can't you know smash it down. Yeah, but man, throw a garbage bag over it and strap it to the top of your pack. Who cares? It that was probably the most incredible thing that I did for my sleep in the backcountry last year. See, and that's that's about where I'm at. Is taking a full-blown pillow, cutting it in half, sewing, legit sewing a pillow. No, man. And I, I'm the pillow snob at my house where... Just go to my pillow. We know he's a true patriot <laughs> just because he gets persecuted by mainstream media. So This uh, design, I wanted, it had a photo of it. Oh, it's not going to do a breakdown. At the beginning, somewhere it had a design where it showed that, uh, oh, it's the thumbnail of the pillow. Or right here. See the memory foam? Yep. And then your inflatable? Yep. I've heard that one's legit. So the my pillow, yeah, my daughter has one. She got it for Christmas and it's the small version. Yep. Maybe my pillow mini. 
Yeah. This little guy, right? Yeah, you can see, you get some context for how big it is on that picture where the, the, the owner's holding it up. That's the real deal, man. Like in the backcountry, that is, oh man. Yeah. How much does that weigh? 29 bucks and it is, it's not even going to have. That's the cheapest thing it will be in your backcountry kit. Yeah, not even going to have a weight. Oh, eight ounces. 8.18 8.18 ounces, and that's probably with some sort of packaging. That's your shipping weight. Yeah, seriously, man. The only thing about it is it does it doesn't it doesn't compress doesn't compress like a like most of the things. But who cares? Like that's that's the game changer, and it's less expensive than any of those backpacking things. Yeah, I mean the Nemo Philo is forty five bucks. Just shows you they know who their demographic is. So. <laughs> Kind of wrapping this whole hodgepodge of stuff together. We talked about... We didn't even get into the stuff that we wanted to get into yet. No, and we... we, You might have to delete this and we'll try again another day. Yeah, we've got got plenty of time now, but I kind of want to cover a quick summary of what we've talked about. We've talked about mindset. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the biggest deer ever killed with a bow. That's, That's a pretty cool little bullet point to have in there. We've talked about gear that makes you last longer in the backcountry, more comfortable, and it unequivocally has a direct correlation of your performance in the backcountry. I don't care what anybody says. I I respect the heck out of Brady Miller, you know, the stoveless diet and yeah, using a skeletonized sleeping pad and just embracing the suck. But I mean, there's other ways to embrace the suck. Yeah. I th- but it, to each their own. For me, that does not work. I mean, Brady's a killer. I respect yeah. I respect the heck out of that dude. What about food? Hold on. Oh, yeah. Check this out. Let's hear it. So this year, and again, this is, I don't know what makes it into the final kit until I actually leave. But because um, I've been trying to, I started eight, nine years ago going down this paleo thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really paleo to me at that time. It was just high fat, low carb, trying to find ways to get a lot of protein and fat into the back country efficiently. Yeah, just calorie rich. Um, And um, and then anyway, full circle, the thing that sits on my stomach the best and works the best, and I've gone away from the high sugar a long time ago, and unfortunately, so the guys that I hunt with, they always have the pop tarts and the Snickers right. and the crap like that. And so, about four or five days in, I'm raiding their their food bags from the <laughs> sugar. So I don't go without sugar. I just don't take my own in. That way, I don't eat as much of it. But uh, I think so. This year, what I'm experimenting with on some of my little overnighters and my upcoming scouting trips is the field stripping, taking you know. I've done that in the past and I went away from it. Definitely going back to it because if you take all of your dehydrated food out of its packaging and throw it in those little steam bags that you get, the Ziploc steam bags, microwavable bags, you can rehydrate things in there just as well. And um, that'll shave quite a few ounces, but more importantly, it's the volume. Yeah. Like the garbage volume after the fact. And the overall size. Yeah, yeah. But also... Because of that, I, I'm going to go to three full meals, meaning backpacking meals, mm-hmm. because it's the lightest way to get the most calories. Three full meals per day. Yeah. And then and then my snacks will just be, because trying to get your calories through nuts and bacon strips, because I'll take in pre-cooked bacon that's packaged and uh, a lot of things like that, just trying to get good fats and proteins in that way, just can never get enough calories. Yeah. And so if you look at the weight to calorie density of your um your peak refuel meals like i'm going to do um what's their pulled pork yeah did they have so many like anyway their pulled pork think of that for breakfast pulled pork on a on a, on a single tortilla for breakfast or else their scrambled eggs for breakfast on a tortilla you ever had their biscuits and gravy yeah dude that's heavy so their creams like i don't think i'm lactose intolerant but they have heavy cream in their biscuits and gravy. They have heavy cream in their Chad Mendez uh, 
oats and peaches or whatever. Oh, wait. oh, that one's so good. Those will rip you up, bro. Like <laughs> I haven't experienced that yet. You do not want to be I'm near just me. Knocking on wood, trying yeah, well, to like not. Get if you that. bring them to camp and I eat them, don't come close. <laughs> so anyway, so but but keeping it fairly, you know, there are a lot of things you can do as a breakfast burrito. Yep. And look, it's not that big of a deal to 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 um, warm some water up. Lunch, the same thing. Dinner, the same thing. Just meals. So that's, you can pack in 3,000 calories in the least amount of weight just by going with meals. It's more expensive. That's if you're in an area with water. Yeah, but even if you're, how do you, how do you consume your water? I mean, so, okay. So before we go to that, before we go to the non-water area, mm-hmm. the, um, the other thing, and again, it takes water, but you ever seen that Huel stuff? Mm. So you got your athletic greens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got your Huel or some other kind of meal in a meal in a powder type of thing. Okay. Mixed with some 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 good quality Dude. egg white protein, and I pre mix that in Ziploc bags, and it's actually kind of heavy that powder mix per day. Mm-hmm. But you pour that in some water, shake it up in your Nalgene, and you're immediately getting a ton of protein and a ton of calories first thing in the morning. Then you have your breakfast burrito, you have your lunch, you have your, and I'm not taking, I used to take sardines and tuna and stuff like that in yeah. for my, for good clean protein. And, uh, it just the, not only the weight going in, but the bulk after the fact, the yeah. garbage bulk after the fact. So I mean, yeah, backpacking meals, um, basically a meal in a, in a bottle look at this. shake. This was a discovery I had. Arizona elk hunt last year. Strawberries and granola, a stoveless breakfast, right? Just you add water. Oh yeah. I take Mountain Ops strawberry protein. I think there's like oh nice. What does it say? Fourteen grams of protein or something. Yeah. In there? Mix you, that together. You're on it. Talk about that for breakfast, dude. And if you condense that to get rid of some packaging, I mean that was legit. It was like a yogurt parfait. It was so good. You're making me hungry. And that was, that was some legit calories and proteins. Are you zoning out a little bit? You need a little energy boost? Take yourself over to mountainops.com and get you some Hush Ignite. It is my favorite source of energy that money can buy. 200 milligrams of caffeine, no crash, clean energy. Use code HUSH at checkout to save you some cash. Hate to interrupt the podcast, guys, but I've got to tell you about the new all-in snapshot digiscoping system. Allin.co has released a magnetic digiscoping setup that allows you to capture HD video through your spotting scope. It's that simple. Capture and share. Allin.co. Use the hush code and save some cash. That's a that's good. See, you've done everything that I've done, but you mixed it in with your strawberries and granola, which is perfect. I'm going to do the same thing, but mine's going to be chocolate granola because I'll use chocolate protein powder. Yeah, dude, that, uh, I'm telling you what, that... Peak refuel. That's a granola. good. It's legit, and it's no stove, right? So. Yeah. Well, I like their again. There's not a peak refuel meal that I dislike. There's just some of them work better for me than others. Yeah, and I I have a set kind of pile of peak refuels that I do just every hunt, and I'm a huge fan. The Bison Ranch Mashers. Really? I I like I like that one. But then my all time favorite is their chicken pesto. It's heavier, but it's got such a thick like sauce. Yeah. And it requires, dude, get this. I think it's like four ounces of water. Yeah. Where a mountain house is like twelve to sixteen ounces of water. Dude, when you're conserving water, that is huge. And dude, I I haven't tasted one I didn't like. This cheesy chicken and broccoli. Me and Logan ate in um, Alaska. I'm totally with you on that. Just and I haven't, I haven't really searched too much. Uh, well, you've been in the same boat that most of us. I mean, everyone probably listening to this podcast has tried at least one or two of the main meals. Yep. And then a lot of people have probably broken off and, and uh, not broken off, but gone out and tried to. Uh, Tried some of the newer entrants into the backpacking, you know, the freeze dried, you know, dehydrated food. Um, and I keep going back to peak just because 
for the calorie and the flavor and the relative cleanliness. Yeah. I would love to sit down with them and have them make something a little bit cleaner. Yeah. Um, but really, they don't have a lot of nastiness in them. Dude, this whole row is basically my go-to. Yeah. That chicken Alfredo, legit. That strawberry granola, so good. Sweet pork and rice on a tortilla. It's Cafe Rio in the backcountry. Well, that, so that's what you have for breakfast, breakfast burrito. Yeah. So Legit. good. And then they're- I switch, out, gravy, dude. I switch out the strawberries and granola for the mountain berry because the, yeah, it, the mountain that's, berry. that's made with coconut milk. It's a little easier on your stomach if you're lactose intolerant than the strawberries. The strawberries and granola taste like Captain Crunch. It does. It's that's so, probably freaking, why I like it. so freaking good. <laughs> the creamy peaches and oats with the biscuits and gravy. <sighs> these two are heavy. But dude, how many calories are these things? Like, it's like twelve hundred calories. That thing, that thing, because of the brown sugar, the peaches and cream. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Eleven hundred calories. That's legit, dude. Yeah. Thirty-four grams of protein. And it tastes good. My kids down the biscuits and gravy. Dude, I would eat like I've told Eric this. So check this one out. What you got to be careful here is the brown sugar, because check out the added sugars. Like 123 grams in a pouch. We've got 1,330 calories. Oh, I'll eat that whole pouch, too. Oh, yeah. Easy. So, what, like, I've told Eric in the back hold, country. Hold on. you got to pull that up, though. I swear it's like 123 grams of added sugars. It's insane. Letting me. Come on. Come on, guy. But it's because it's got real brown sugar in it. And it's got real heavy cream that's freeze-dried. So amazingly good. Yeah, 122 grams of total sugar, sorry. Dang. Added sugars of 40 grams. <laughs> yeah, this this is such a good breakfast. I've told Eric that basis and gravy, if I ordered that at like a restaurant for breakfast, yeah. I would be pleased. Same with that chicken pesto. If I went to an Italian, <laughs> an Italian restaurant and ordered chicken pesto and they just... No offense to any Italians listening. <laughs> no, dude, I'm telling you, I don't know... How hungry I am when I'm eating this stuff in the backcountry, but 43 grams of protein, dude, and it takes like no water for the chicken pesto. Granted, it's a heavier pack in. It's not that bad. So, but check out. So, my favorite is the. Um, ah, you got to pull it up here, so that I can see it because I eat it. That's the one that I. Uh, the, oh, the chicken coconut curry. Oh yeah. Um, again, if you look, so look at the sugar content on that one. Yeah, see, there you go. That's one of your low, lower total sugar meals that they have, but you still have high calories. So. I haven't had this one. Oh, dude, it's off the charts good. Like I can eat that. I can eat that 10 nights in a row. So peak refuel, if you're listening, uh, send us a bunch of these, please. So here's, even though it's like a vegetarian dish. Yeah. The butternut dalbot is so good. Dude, they just don't miss. No, no. But those two, if you try them, you'll be like, oh, I think those are my new favorites. This is- Dude, 44 this, grams of protein. Like the sweet and sour yeah. pork. The Chicken problem with the teriyaki rice. and the sweet and sour pork is a ton of added sugar. So when you're trying to keep it fairly clean, even in the back country. Dude, so those, uh, these cookie bites right here? Yeah. <laughs> my kids, those I, are cracked, my kids. I put dehydrated milk in there, oh, get to dude. the back country, add some water. What? It's like you've chips been, ahoy. You've been holding out, man. Yeah, that's that's kind of an elite level uh hack hack there. But uh But look at that, that'll kill you, man. It's totally worth it. <laughs> I will eat that every day. No. So food. I mean, when you hunt with Casey and Logan. They always have the best food and the best snacks. And like, you always are just jealous, you know? <laughs> like between just a solid peak refuel peak refuel stack, you know, and some proper supplements, you know, you have your greens, your reds. I love like some BCAs in the backcountry. I love some collagen and some, uh, oh, what was I just going to say? Can't think of it. Some collagen and uh, what am I looking for here? Skip I take it. all my vitamins in. Skip it. 
But I, I what are your top? Five I'm not a believer in branch chain amino acids. I think there's enough data out there now that it's just a sales gimmick. Really, everyone that puts it in is full. But <laughs> if you get full blown aminos, so you get um, at some brand, some doctor created. I have it in my. But I take in amino acids, just not branch chain amino acids. Take aminos. Um, I take all my normal vitamins, which is quite a dose of vitamin D. You know, like your K2, MK7. Um, and then uh, I just have a package just of things. a hodgepodge? It doesn't matter. I get my blood drawn every six months. We sit down and go over what I need, make sure things are clean. I'm almost 50, man. Got to take care of things. You don't look 50. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but this year, wow, you just could have, you kind of made it, maybe screwed things up. I might be doing some cookie bite cereal. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's, it's worth it. What, what bow are you shooting? What's your arrow setup? What's your sight? What's your broadhead? What bow? I like that stuff. Let's hear it. But since I get everything dialed in, I forget the details. So you'll have to work me through it okay. because I do all the research up front, do the testing. And then once I put it on the bow, I'm like, yeah, it's that site. So it's the, um, CBE. No. Landslide. Yeah. No landslide. Okay. So going to the five pin landslide, I like that site a lot. It's been super user friendly. The CBE prior was probably the most easy to set up for second, third access site I've had. Easy to site in. The landslide takes that all next level. And I think it's just a little, little more bomber. I've gone away from the dovetail. I like the direct mount. The pick. Picatinny. No, the direct mount. I don't like okay. the Picatinny because everyone that has a Picatinny rail mount right now, they have not adjusted their sight so that it's actually in line with the riser the way it's supposed to be. You look at every pick mount that I've seen, here's the pick mount and you adjust, you hook your sight to it and then there's an offset to bring the sight back over so that you have the adjustments. Yep. So you're not really picking up anything in, in as line. far as I can tell. Um, and bringing the weight in line with your riser because of the way the current pick mounts are set up. So I just went back to the direct mount because I didn't feel the dovetail. I think it works for a target archery, but I think when you're in the back country, uh, direct mount is is, is um, a more secure option. Okay. RX-7. Oh, man. I did this online lesson with George Riles earlier. This that how you say his name? I think so. That's the Archery crispy, coach. Dude. Yeah. So... It's really cool and it's super reasonable because like go try to take a golf lesson, cost you an arm and a leg, right? So anyway, set my phone up on the tripod and go through a one hour, I don't know what it was, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour lesson with George Riles just going through because I wanted to start all kind of from scratch Uh because I've been rehabbing a shoulder. Yep. Um, And um, so long story short is in going through that, George pointed out that I looked a little bit So my RX-7, where I started at 29 inches of draw, I'm actually shooting at 30 inches draw length right now, and I've never felt more comfortable and never felt more solid at anchor. Okay, so let's let's talk through that. Longer draw length, heavier arrow. Yeah. Faster FPS. It all boiled down between the draw length and the arrow speed, arrow arrow weight. weight. I maybe picked up a couple of feet per second. Okay. And then this is something BMAC and I were talking about the other day. A lot of people being shallow in their draw length. Yeah. Their bow arm is not, it's standing alone. It's your bow arm. But when you can have a proper draw length and engage your chest and your back alongside your bow arm, that pin's not floating very much anymore. It's much better. It's much better. So without having, because if you go to the bro science of the local bow shop. Yep. They're the, I mean, every bow shop that I walk into is like, oh, you're, you know, five foot 10, you're a 28 inch draw length. Yep. No one knows that I have over six foot one wingspan, mm-hmm. right? And no one cares because they just look at my stature and no one, they have these preconceived ideas. I don't know what it is, but having an independent, objective, professional, and then form of George, Coach George, Mm -hmm. looking at me on video and saying, not even asking what I had my draw length set at. Just we were shooting, going through this process. Oh, you look, you know, you look a little bit scrunched. Well, I can't expand the way I want to. And I never, anyway, where I landed comfortably, 
uphill and downhill shots or uphill and downhill shots, right? Yep. 30 inches. Dang. And it's amazing how when I get into that position, how solid it feels. And it also takes tension off of this bicep tendonitis that I had up here mm-hmm. because I come back and I'm all the way back at full draw instead of being like this. Yeah. Um, and no matter how many people that really shoot well that I've shot with, that I've asked to critique me, no one's ever diagnosed that. Yeah. And it took George like 15 minutes. He's like, yeah, your draw length's too short. Worth every penny, along with a bunch of other little gems that he shared with me to help me with my shooting. And it's still a process. That's what I love about archery. I mean, it's just, it's, it's this discipline where you can go deep down this vein of progression that, that I really enjoy. And that, and then archery hunting just takes that to the next level. Yeah. I mean, so I've seen your laboratory of. Now, uh, here's my other thing. I'm going down. We're just, we're pimping a bunch of brands that I pay full price for. Iron Will. Yep. The first time I've seen anyone put real data behind Aeroflight, veins, quietness, helical. I think there are a lot of sharp people that have a lot of experience that will share with you what they think is best for offset and helical and vein setup and all this other stuff. And then some of them that have a voice in the community obviously make money off of it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what they tell you to shoot could be influenced by how much they make off of it. Yep. Whereas Iron Will, I think he went at it with an open mind, tested a lot of veins, a lot of setups, and landed on that AAE. Now he has his own, um, the, the max version of it, which is a different compound that the veins made out of. So going back to a three fletch with helical, um, slightly longer now because of my draw length going, and I've always liked the hit insert, but I've never been able to get the weight the way I wanted it in a hit. For a while, I bought this, this, uh, tap and I would tap the back of my hit inserts and then thread the gold tip weights into my hit inserts to be able to get them, get the weight that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, now I just go with the iron wheel setup with the collar and the whole thing. Uh, so you're shooting that iron wheel broadhead? No, just their inserts and their their collar. Okay, so I haven't broad- I haven't gone to. <laughs> you haven't gone to the six hundred dollars? No, I three hundred dollars. I still like, no matter how well tuned the bow is, with all the variables that come into play in the backcountry, I still like shooting a mechanical for accuracy and forgiveness. And what's your mechanical choice? Sever. Sever. Okay, but. I'm a, I'm kind of a, the, when, when, when Ulmer, when Randy and his brother released the Ulmer Edge years ago, and then I found out that those were going away, I stockpiled as many deep six thread pattern, original Ulmer Edge hundred grainers as I could. And I still have those. And then I have my sever stock, but yeah, I hunt with a sever just because when you look at everything taken into context, I really think there's some decent science behind how accurate that is in the wind. Take some of the variables out. One of the killingest broadheads, I mean, when I've ripped things to shreds, um, has been the um, Grim Reaper. Yeah, that's what I'm shooting this year. Those broadheads are beasts. The mini mag. Like, like, like you can you can miss the kill zone and still drop a deer in its tracks with those things. But, um, that's kind of a lot of room for air. But the biggest thing I don't like about them is they're loud. Like unmistakably, you can hear it, and I know the, the 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 animal on the receiving end can hear it coming. So all in all, for accuracy and and wind and everything else, the sever is is the broadhead I really like. Okay, and uh, what arrow is that on? I don't have the cash to buy pro comps, but I don't like anything with aluminum because I'm afraid there's memory there. Yeah. So I shoot the four millimeter long range. Okay. Gold tip. Yep. Yep. No, four Eastern. millimeter. Eastern. Eastern four millimeter long range. Yep. What is it like? Three hundred spine. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. It weighs out. I know people are going to ask these questions because four hundred seventy-five, a little over four hundred seventy-five grains. Perfect. I'm going two hundred and eighty-two feet per second. I'm two sixty-five or uh, four sixty-five going two eighty-three. What the hell are you shooting? BTM, but with their new mods. 
my draw length is at the top of the mod, so it's at its top performance. I would I would like maybe closer to like that 480 grain arrow, but I built my whole bow for mule deer this year, and I'm gonna take arrow clearance over arrow weight. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean. That's crazy. I'm running a VAP TKO V3, so it's got a lighter grains per inch. So my front of center is a little better, running uh, 150 grains up front. You guys work with VAP? Nope. No? Dude, I went- I just love how they have their arrows spine aligned. They look good. Factory. Yeah. They show you where your spine is, and they have research spine testing their arrows. You got to show me that. And it's accurate. It has an arrow that says spine. With a line down the arrow. So that's where I put my knock vein. Yeah. I knock tune my arrow off that line. And Boom. dude, just S- grouping like crazy. So you know the RAM spine tester thing? Yep. yep. I have two dozen of those four millimeter long range from Easton. I cut them, got everything. And then before I put anything in them, I went to one of those. I, I got a hold of one of those RAM testers and ran them through it. The tolerances on those things are silly tight. That's so good to know. The trade-off is, and I don't know anything about the arrow that you shoot, Yeah, but you either have the company tell you where the spine is, or you have an arrow that has such tight tolerances like the Eastern, yeah. that you can almost shoot it shoot it with your knock position anywhere and it shoots the same. That's my experience, right? Yep. yep. Trying to knock tune those things. They're pretty solid. That's, uh, that's kind of what I've experienced with these um, VAT TKOs is... Uh, I didn't go to the extreme of putting them in a bathtub and marking them and stuff or put them in one of those RAM testers. But I've watched a lot of their research and have some competition shooters that are way better shots than I am that swear by a VAP TKO era. I want to see those things. Yeah, they're, they're super sweet. So that's kind of what I'm running. But um, yeah, man, it's, it's super interesting because mechanical broadheads. <laughs> I, uh, every deer I've killed has been with a mechanical broadhead and the last two or three deer I've killed have been outwards of 70 yards and hit them in the shoulder and the mechanical goes through the deer's shoulder and they die. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I love the accuracy yeah. of a mechanical. I love the margin for error, aiming center mass on a deer. Yeah. And I mean, I just, that's basically enough for me. And granted, I I will play devil's advocate. Shooting in some branches or anything that could potentially steer an arrow one way or another, a heavy single bevel, crazy front of center arrow would bode better. But most of these mule deer spots I'm hunting aren't necessarily shooting through tight pine trees or a box of toothpicks, you know, I'm, I mean, that's kind of where I, what's the word there, kind of compromise my brain. And then second is I'm not shooting an elk in a shoulder blade. I mean, elk are substantially tougher than a mule deer. And I've, I've lost mule deer with mechanicals, Mm -hmm. but was it a proper shot? Was it a proper angle? Was I aiming for an exit? Did I have my bow tune, I, I mean, all this stuff adds up and it's just like, I I still am leaning mechanical. I've had good experience with both. I just, <clears throat> and I want to use a heavy front of center, but I can't, I mean, I, I did the one year, I did the full Valkyrie system. I enjoyed it. My arrow was like 250 feet per second and fell out of the air like it was on a parachute, like poof. Yeah. Right. Not really. I mean, there's a ton of momentum yep. behind that thing. Um, but to your point, and I kind of take my lead from people that have way more experience than I do. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, in the form of Randy Olmer, I drop his name a lot because he's he's a sound minded individual. He's the goat that has yeah. <laughs> like like I would yeah. That's that's the, he hunts. I think where and how I like to hunt. Um. And he has a lot more experience with all these things and um, designed his own mechanical broadhead. And ultimately, that's what became the Sever. Yep. Right? Um, then you talk to, you know, Tim Gillingham. He's going to shoot mechanicals. Um, 
these guys shoot their bows a lot. At Bateman, Kip Fowler. I mean, and at a lot of animals. Brown right? bears, flipping. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. So, in my own experience with mechanicals versus fixed, is yeah, I can tell there's a difference on how quickly and cleanly a, a, a arrow yeah broad. goes broadheads goes through the animal yep. but the blood trail is also completely different every single time and I don't even want to say like don't have to knock on wood or anything the one animal that I lost was an elk and it had nothing to do with the broadhead it was just that one situation where it had turned, I ranged it, it turned and walked, and I thought it was walking kind of away from me, and actually because of the way everything was set up, it was actually walking dead parallel, so it took about seven steps, and I was like, I'll just aim a little bit higher, mid, you know, and my arrow hit right where my pin was, and it was right there in the dead zone. Dang. There was yeah. no blood. There was no nothing. I went back for days. There was, I honestly think that elk lived oh, just a happy life. Undoubtedly. But um, going back to all the animals that I've killed, um, I've never had a problem with a, with a mechanical. Yeah. Well, you've killed definitely more big deer than 99% of the population. Average guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, so kind of kind of in closing of this whole podcast is I couldn't be more excited for this season. I couldn't feel more prepared with my bow. I've never shot a bow better. Yeah. I've never shot my bow as much as I have. I'm already getting on my second set of strings. I've uh, been able to paper tune my bow several times this year, just really getting stuff dialed. I uh, am just now... I mean, our snow and winter and everything has been crazy. Starting to spend two to three days a week scouting. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I mean, if I can get this food and this sleep system dialed, I mean, um, I will have no excuses. Let's just say that. And it sounds like you're in a similar boat. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this year's crop? Are you nervous? Yeah. So uh, I have a. I, I have a. I hadn't hunted the Wasatch Front. We'll just kind of talk. Openly, I don't know when you're going to release this or if you will actually after you listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I have a Wasatch Front archery tag, right? And then I have a, an archery tag in, in Colorado and I have a, an elk tag down in New Mexico. That's more hunting than I've ever done in any one season. And I came into this year, even with the winter, the way the Wasatch Front lines up and the winter, at, winter, winter ground for that area, I was like, I think the deer were okay because we'd get these these west and south facing slopes to burn off pretty decent, even in the deep snow. Yep. Um, but um, I'm not, I, at this point here, we sit almost August 1st. I think I'm going to spend opening day of Utah archery season scouting the Colorado back country. That's I, I'm getting the impression that winter is winter here is far worse than as bad as we think it was. I get the impression it was far worse than I think we even want to admit. Um, so that's my impression on Utah. It's anecdotal. It's probably worthless, but I don't know that I'm going to hunt my tag on the Wasatch front. The deer got enough last year. Yeah. They don't need me chasing around with a bow and arrow. Um, so that's my impression of Utah, but I'm super stoked about Colorado. Uh, they're, you know, the winter, even though they had a good winter there, they just, for whatever reason, they have better winter habitat. Less development. And, yeah, and I think some animals, some good animals were able to make it through. So I'm super excited about Colorado, archery deer, as always. And then I kind of have a once-in-a-lifetime deal that I've never anticipated where I get to go down and hunt the Gila um, elk. Well, Chad Money Mendez, dude. Yeah, dude, that's so funny. I get to meet him. That, I'm excited about dude, that. Dude. Yeah, that'll be super rad. Get to, It's a unique hunt for me. Get to spend time in a camp with like-minded people, sleeping on a bed, doing things that it's, it's be like. Different. But I, I'm excited just to learn from the guy. I've never been on a guided hunt. Um, excited to to spend time learning from people that really they spend months up close and personal with those animals, 
and they get to see a lot of different hunting styles. So, I mean, it, when you see that much of what not to do, yeah, it's really easy to kind of determine what are best practices. And so hopefully I'll get a, kind of a, a boot camp in elk hunting and, and learn some things that I, that I didn't know before. That's what I'm looking to forward to the oh, most dude, out of this Elk hunt. are big and stinky and they bugle and you just run at them. <laughs> see, and that's, that's, uh, I, I want to, I want to see how things go down because, um, did you guys know that Hush has a brand new mobile app and it is completely free. Simply search, get Hush in where you get your apps. It's compatible with the iOS and Android platforms with the app. You're going to get a lot faster checkout process for those of you who love to shop the Hush brand. We also do app exclusive content. The only place to get this content is simply on the mobile app and it's free. And don't forget, we do in-app exclusive giveaways. If you guys want to win some of the great products that you see us use in our videos, check out the mobile app today. The Hush Life podcast is brought to you by absolutely nobody. However, if you own a smartphone and you want to save a little bit of money, make sure you check out the OnX Hunt app. It offers a variety of key features to improve your hunting experience. From nationwide public and private land boundaries, waypoints, lines, and all kinds of data you can share with your buddies, to 3D topical graphical maps you can explore while scouting for your upcoming hunt. Make sure you type in code HUSH. You will save 20% on all hunt app opportunities. And if you want to take it to the next level, hit that elite button. It'll get you access to all 50 states. Absolutely, unequivocally, the greatest tool we take with us on every single hunt. I, I mean, just it's not the kind of hunt that I would no. pay for, but because I want it in a drawing, I couldn't be more excited because it'll be a totally new experience. I'm not going to pack up and go to a backcountry hunt yeah. like I did the year that I had the, you know, the um, the Henry's tag. Um, just going to enjoy every bit of the experience and see what I can take away. And hopefully, I mean, I know they grow some big big elk on the Gila, so. This is a great year to have a tag. <laughs> dude. Just, uh, dude, you could see anything out there. But yeah, guys, for all those listening, I hope you kind of enjoyed this this podcast. We chased a lot of rabbits down a lot of holes today. And those are some of my favorite podcasts to listen to, where it's kind of, you never know what topic they're, they're going to talk about next. But uh, yeah, season will be upon us before we know it. And make sure that you guys are preparing properly. And hopefully you are able to draw a couple things from this podcast that may improve your season or improve your odds. Uh, super grateful for my uncle Justin to come here and to uh, really just drop some knowledge and and share some of his stories and lessons learned. I I learn something new every time we talk and we don't talk nearly as much as we used to. I know you're busy, man. We need to sit down. I we didn't even touch on some of the key no, things. There will be a part two to this. <laughs> we might you there you may never see part one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but dude, super grateful. Good luck to you on your hunts this year. And just a reminder to all those listening or watching, if you guys enjoyed this podcast, make sure you leave a like or a comment and share with a friend or family member. Uh your guys' feedback is really what drives the amount of content we produce. So if you guys like these podcasts or these hunt stories, make sure you let us know that you guys are enjoying these because that will increase the cadence of this type of content. And I couldn't be more stoked for this season, uh, more grateful for the tags I have in pocket. Yeah. And uh, yeah, guys, get out there, shoot straight. Good luck to you. Thanks, Maddie. Yep. Thanks, man. See you, buddy. See ya.